David Powell is an inspirational speaker whose passion is to inspire and motivate people to live life to the fullest, to follow their dreams, regardless of their circumstances. His journey began at birth being born without hands and malformed legs. And as a child, he got around in an electric wheelchair using his feet as his hands. Now, David and I also went to high school together. So I've seen firsthand his ability to do things with his feet that I'm not even capable of doing with my hands. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing, but impressive nonetheless. After the separation of his parents, David relocated to Dallas. He became a patient at Scottish Rite for children and started walking with the help of prosthetics. Without his feet available anymore, he once again adapted and learned to do everything he did with his feet, but with his arms. Um, unfortunately, David lost his mother to a drug overdose. A few years later, fell into a drug addiction, alcoholism until the age of 29. But once again, as proven by his story, David beat the odds and overcame those struggles. He's now fulfilling one of his lifetime dreams of becoming a motivational speaker to help people through helpful messages on life and its perspectives. And David is living proof that anything can be achieved with a correct mindset. David, welcome to the show, my man. Appreciate you, dude. dude nice it's great to, to have you on, man. I'll be honest with you. As soon as I started recording these, you were one of the first people on my list. Nice just because have, I think your story, you know, I, I've... I've come to appreciate your story a lot more as I've gotten older. Um, and a lot of it, honestly, I didn't even know about. And I'm really excited to, to hear from you a little bit more what you've been through because it, it has been a few years, like you said, before we started recording, I think probably 10 years, yeah, <laughs> since we yeah. last saw each other. So yeah. um, a lot's happened, man. But, um, you know, I, I've, I, like I said, I've become more impressed with your story and just how you have overcome what, what, what otherwise people take for granted, right? Just waking right. up and, and having hands or having feet. Like it, it's like such a simple thing that people are like, well, of, course, <laughs> take, right? of course I do that until you, you don't. Up. And then it's like, right. man, your whole world perspective shifts. So yeah. um, I, I want to start off by going all the way back. And, you know, I, I don't know, you know, this happens at a different time for everybody else. Do you remember the first time where you realized that you were different or that there was something different about you than, than the other kids? And this probably come up and uh, as we go through it, but I really don't. But my parents really didn't, they didn't hold me back with anything. So, I mean, I could, I still did everything I wanted to do. And I've always learned how to adapt to do things that most people do. So I really never saw myself as disabled, handicapped, whatever you want to use. Um, I know as I got older, I mean, of course, I realized I'm different than other people. Sure. I, I don't ever remember the time where I was like, damn, I don't have, you know, I'm, I can't do certain things. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain. I, I guess the bottom line is, no, I don't. And that's because I was never really in a situation where I was held back to realize I'm disabled. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. You know, from my experience with you, I, that that's how I remember interacting with you in high school. Like it was never, it never came up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's you all were, to my parents, man. yeah, you could do or would do, or at least try to do everything else that everybody else would do. Like there was no, like, oh, David always needs help. Like, you were completely independent, um, you know, in, in a ton of ways. It was football. crazy. Couldn't play football, obviously. That's <laughs> yeah, but you can still that. throw a better spiral than probably right. I can nine out of ten times. So <laughs> Throw that nub on it. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm grateful I at least got to be with the team. All my friends were on the team anyway. That's where my core group of friends were. Yeah. So, uh, it worked out. You know, I still traveled with the team and whatnot, and that might come up later on. But uh, I've, so, never, I've just never let it stop me. Yeah, you credit your parents with that. I'm just curious, was that something that they did on purpose? Like, what, you know, were they really dead set on making sure that you, you know, just didn't feel like you were handicapped or disabled or anything like that? And this is going to make good conversation with that question. So my dad contributed in his own way. My mom contributed in her own way. Um, I'll start with my dad. Um, when we used to go out in public, my mom was kind of the one that was nervous and maybe embarrassed to go out in public with me because this when I was born this was back in the 80s so they didn't have right. sounds really the way they do now so it was totally caught off guard and surprised so um my mom was the one that was kind of more devastated than I mean my dad was devastated too but my mom took it really hard and she was kind of embarrassed to go out to the mall because she was worried about what people may think or how people right. would react and she was worried not only or embarrassed on her sake, but if she also cared about what I thought or how, how I was going to feel from it. Um, my dad, on the other hand, he didn't treat me any different. You know, we always went out. I mean, he, he got my mom to, you know, they all, we all went out to get at the mall and stuff. But one cool thing about my dad from a young age is if someone did come up and say what happened, um, probably from the age of like four and five, he'd say, well, he's right there. You know, you ask him. Hmm. The question's for him to so ask him. And I think that right there, kind of got me in the mindset that I am different, but I didn't feel different. 
from everybody else, but I was comfortable on my own skin. Yeah. I had no problem telling people what was wrong or not what was wrong, but what had happened and whatnot. And um, so, so that's how my dad kind of really helped. Now my mom, even in my presentations, uh, talk about this. This sounds like neglect. This sounds kind of bad, but it is what it is. And it actually was a benefit later on in life. But my mom was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And um, her go-to was alcohol and Xanax, which uh, doesn't end, end good. <laughs> yeah, right. And being in school, there was many times where I couldn't wake her up. I'd have to call a friend to come uh, and a friend of the family to come pick me up and go to school um, if I was late where I missed the bus or whatnot. But because of those experiences, I have no, I, I've never had patience. So, I mean, if she was out and I was hungry, I'd go get in the fridge and just try and start making stuff for myself or figuring out how to get myself dressed, which I ended up figuring out on my own. But being in those situations allowed me to have the mindset to, well, how am I going to do this? If nobody's around, how am I going to do this for myself? And as you've seen firsthand, I've conquered a lot of that. Yeah. yeah, that's just my instinct, and I, I credit that. Like I said, it sounds bad. It, it, it's my mom not properly taking care of me, but uh, I credit my mindset to those experiences that my mom gave me on accident. So, yeah, and, and I, I totally second everything you're talking about because I never remember noticing that anything was was different or wrong with your lifestyle like i i, I don't think i ever met your mom and i definitely no. never knew about anything that was going on i mean you, right. you were completely independent in that sense that you know it was never really it never became an issue that people were aware of because you just took care of business right regardless you know like yep, you yep. just always had things squared away so yeah that that's incredible um so in doing research yeah so is, is that accurate you moved to dallas when your parents um, separated it was after they separated um, so I was living in New Orleans at the time that's where I was born and raised until I moved to Texas and um, my parents split when I was three and my dad stuck around in New Orleans for a couple months but then he got a job in, in Dallas and so he ended up relocating but I stayed with my mom and um, I remember as a kid, my, my dad knew what was going on. You know, he knew her lifestyle, the type of people she was having come to the house and what she was doing and whatnot. But he also knew that's where my wife was, that's where my friends were, that's where my wife was. And um, like most boys, I was a huge mama's boy, and I couldn't right. imagine you know, without my, or living, not living with my mom. So um, he let it go on for a while, which he regretted eventually. But um, when I was nine, um, I was actually visiting my dad um, for Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is a holiday in New Orleans. So um, I was with my dad in Dallas for that time. And the day before I was supposed to come home, my dad got a call from his lawyer. And he told her that my mom was in landed in treatment because she passed out at a restaurant. And she ended up in a treatment center. And there was no one to pick me up. And that's when my dad was like, oh, that's the line right there, you know. I, I gave Dave, Dave a, a little while to have what he wanted, but I have to be a parent now. And he put his foot down, and um, I never went back. And um, from that point, you know, that's when I went to Scott Tried, started walking. Um, that's when I went to Pope Elementary, then Shaq and Lamar. But um, to kind of further on that a little bit, because um, when I talk about this in presentations, I guess I'm going to treat this like one. Um, I remember the, the day I was at my babysitter and my dad came over and was like, you know, he'll be back tomorrow. He's not, not leaving today. He'll be back tomorrow. And I'll, I knew something was up. I started bawling immediately. And um, we, we went to the park and that's when he let me know that. And um, that was pretty traumatic, you know, being ripped away from everything I knew, my dog, my mom, <laughs> my friends, my school, um, you know, everything. And no, no heads up or no nothing, just bam, it's gone. So um, that took a toll on me, I think, growing up. But uh, we got through it. Um, I started walking. I was in a wheelchair at that time. I don't think you knew me in a wheelchair. But that was back in elementary school. And um, when I went to Pope, I was in a wheelchair. Like Autumn Hudson, Ian Wagner, all in there, remember me rolling in the wheelchair. And um, I started walking. Um, I give my, my stepmom a lot of credit to that because my dad tended to coddle me 
if I said it was hurting or if I said I didn't want to, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But then that's when my stepmom would come in, like, nope, you got to keep walking laps or keep doing this or doing that. And if it wasn't for her, I really don't think that I would have been, ever been walking. So I'm going to give my stepmom a lot of credit for that. Um, that's awesome. Uh, when when did you transfer to Pope? Because I, I ended up there in sixth grade. And like you said, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't actually recall if you were still there, but you definitely weren't in the wheelchair if you were, because I would remember that. I was in Pope. Pope only went to fifth grade, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Already go to sixth. I went there in sixth, so I don't know what that says about yeah. me. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I got held back and they just didn't tell me. <laughs> no, I, went, I moved in 1995 or 96. All right. And I was in fourth grade. We would have been in fourth grade because uh, we were in the same year. So uh, it was fourth grade. But uh, when I got to fifth grade and I guess sixth grade too, yeah, because Shaq was only seventh and eighth grade, you're right. Um, I was walking for the most part in fifth and sixth grade because uh, I moved to the very beginning of fourth grade year. And – you know me a lot better than most back in that time. And um, when I want to do something, I'm going to do it. I don't, I don't tiptoe around. If I want to do something, I'm going to do it. So that was something I wanted to do. And it didn't really take me that much time to learn. It just took the endurance to gain in order to do that all the time. But I was up and walking within, you know, a month or two. And it just took me a lot of gaining endurance I needed to be able to walk, you know, like anybody else. So um, I think I'm pretty sure I was walking in fifth and fifth grade. So I guess fourth grade would have been the only year that I had my wheelchair. Yeah, but. and that's, that's such a good point. That's not that's something I had never really thought about before, but you, the, the, the physical demands of actually doing that, like ignoring the, the, the skill and the perseverance and all that stuff that goes into, you know, basically learning to walk with prosthetics and do all these other things. And there's like, it's just physically demanding. Right, yeah. You know, obviously life is made easier that's why our bodies are designed the way they are. So like you're overcoming the obstacle of being able to do these things and spending a ton more energy doing it. Yeah. I'd never thought yeah. about that. Definitely yeah, thought about before. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> so I'm curious, you, obviously you, your home life was a little bit up and down. Your parents were, you know, separated. You had your stepmom as you were developing, like into your teens and, and getting into high school, who were the people that, you were really looking for approval from like who were the people that you were trying to please like i know for me as always my mom and dad i just you know wanted to do everything i could to you know get validation in their eyes i never really cared that much about what my peers thought um in fact if my peers were doing something i usually thought it was probably a thing i shouldn't be doing um but uh, i'm just curious who that was for you you know as you as you go through those formative years and start kind of becoming your own person who were the people that you right. were looking for that validation from um, well, like you said, it's always been my parents. Um, so it's always been my dad, even after my mom passed, and even my stepmom. Um, and I'm not trying to back, backslide it all, but this might be kind of a good thing to know. Um, when I was living with my mom, with her conditions, I was kind of the adult in the house. Um, I dictated where I ate in the house. It wasn't like eating at the dinner table with your family. I could eat in the living room, get a Dr. Pepper, you know, five or six years old whenever I wanted to. Right. Um, there was no really any structure. So when I moved with my dad and my stepmom, and now remember too, I'm, I'm the only child or was. So when I moved with my dad, I all of a sudden had um, two, two brothers and a sister now. So that was a whole nother um, learning process with how to share and just how to, live with brothers and si brothers with siblings so um another aspect is they had structure they had the dinner table every night as a family um you know i was so used to doing whatever i want and then when i got into that situation me and my stepmom butted heads a lot mm. because i ran the show with mom and all of a sudden they're telling me what to do and uh me and my stepmom we really until I got older, me and my stepmom always butted heads. And I think that contributes to us not having a, a good start because of the situation. Um, we have a great relationship today, but, uh, yeah, there was all kinds of stuff that goes into me moving with siblings, um, with power, <laughs> with structure. So, um, kind of lost my train of thought a little bit right there. <laughs> well, I mean, we were talking about who, you know, the, the people that were important okay, to you in terms gotcha. of who you were looking right, for right, approval right. from. So my dad, stepmom, um, 
And as I got older, you know, going through junior high, um, it, it was kind of weird. I, I normally never cared about what peers thought. Um, but when mom died, that, that changed me. And I, I don't understand how it affected and what I'm about to explain. But um, if you remember me in high school, unless I was drinking, of course, I was kind of quiet a little bit. Right. Um, and that was always because I was worried I was going to say something stupid or I know we talked a lot of shit in our, our group and I was good at it, but I didn't like taking it sometimes. Yeah. And um, being around certain friends that we had, it happened all the time. So sometimes I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to deal with it. But um, now it's all, I, I was worried about what, what y'all thought or what, you know, my peers thought. And that just took some growing up to do to be myself and not really care what anybody thinks. <laughs> Um, you know, I always want family to approve it sometimes in my art. There's been points in my past where they haven't approved, obviously, but, um, yeah, I guess I just had to grow up. So, and, and you mentioned your mom passing and that was your freshman year. So you would have been yes. what, 13 or 14. So I was 14. Um, <laughs> as I've said, my mom, my dad and my mom met in recovery here in Salina where I'm living now. And, um, my dad kind of got the concept, but my mom never did. So she never really stopped. Um, so that story is the last time I remember talking to my mom. Um, we talk all the time still. Um, she was leaving. She was at the airport about to catch a flight to Phoenix, Arizona, because um, we had a cousin that was living with my mom in Wichita Falls. And this, this is around the time when the Internet became a happening thing, chat rooms and whatnot. And um, my cousin, I guess, was dancing, <laughs> um, kind of like an escort or whatever, not on the internet for guys. And um, she had a couple sugar daddies, or whatever you want to call it. And um, she met one in Arizona that bought her an RV. And the conditions were she'd have to fly down there and pick it up, but she didn't want to have to tote her van. She didn't want to have to... Um, um, have the van behind her to, to carry and so the guy told my cousin if, if my mom came down he would pay her to drive the van behind her to get everything back to texas so when mom got there this is all assumptions because the last time anybody talked the last time i talked to her was when she was at the airport leaving and nobody really had contact with my cousin so we, we didn't ever know what really happened but we think that the the guy reneged on paying her what he agreed to. And my mom and cousin, we did find out, went to a casino, were drinking, and in the toxicity report, my mom had methadone in her system. The amount that was found in her system is enough to overdose, but then it was within the parameters of what she was prescribed from her doctor. So it was an, an accidental overdose. And at the time, we never tried to pursue the doctors because I was young. You know, it was all a lot, a lot of stuff was going on. So um, it was ruled as an accidental overdose. Um, I remember the Friday that I found out was a Friday that she was supposed to have already been back and picking me up for the weekend to go to Wichita Falls. And I don't know if it was just intuition because me and mom were very connected where – I haven't heard from her getting back. I, I just felt something was off. And that whole day I was worried about that something happened to her. And um, at that time I was riding the bus. Um, my parents met me at the bus stop, which they don't normally do. So that's when I just knew, oh shit, something's, something's right. wrong. Right. So um, I got in the car, we had a Suburban at the time. Um, we had bucket seats, so my stepmom got out of the front seat, and she got back in the, one of the bucket seat, our bucket seats with me, and that's when I really knew that I started crying, bawling, like, what's wrong with mom? What happened? What happened? And um, that's when they let me know that she had passed. And of all the experiences I've had in life, whether it was drugs, whether it was withdrawal from drugs, whether it was, you know, dealing with my disability, whether it was anything, throughout all my life experiences, that one, hands down, was the most traumatic um, undescribable unless you've been in a situation like that a mixture of suffocation can't breathe uh, anxiety pain you know any kind of emotion you can think of i was feeling all at once um 
I remember we had a garage sale that week and I found out and I was outside just looking at down the street constantly hoping she turned the corner and that she was just running late or that you know, nobody knew what they were talking about. She was still coming. It was just very traumatic, man. And uh, as I earlier said, in junior high and elementary school, I didn't give a shit what anybody thought. I was spoke my mind. I was very outgoing, you know, didn't care what people thought, spoke my mind. But when mom died, it, I don't know how that all comes together psychologically, or how that makes sense. But I was all of a sudden just kind of a lot more reserved than I normally was. Um, I was real. I thought too much about what I was going to say before I said it in fear of I was going to look like an idiot or I wasn't going to make sense or just weird things you just wouldn't think about happened during that. And uh, that took years to rebound from. And I think from that, that's when, you know, <clears throat> that's when partying really started, you know, in high school. And I, I think the trigger from that was when mom died. I, I, I truly feel even if mom was still alive in high school, I would have drank and whatnot, but I don't feel that I would have experienced other drugs. Um, I know in high school, it was just pot every now and then and drinking, of course, but I was always lying to my parents because, you know, I wasn't allowed to go to parties. Um, I don't know how they believe me when I said I'm going to stay the night in Adam's house. I didn't think I was going to go to a party or something, but uh, that's just how it was. Um, a lot of lying and then a lot of anxiety from having to cover my basis and have my story straight with what I was doing and whatnot. Just a lot of bullshit went into that. And um, then after I graduated high school and I, um, I'm going to use names because I know, you know who I'm talking about. Our audience might not, but when me, Gary yeah. and, Dan yeah. and church moved out together, um, Gary's really the only one that stayed on track with stuff because uh, he, he eventually left because we were too wrapped up on the party scene. You know, school kind of faded out for us. We weren't really going that much anymore. I'm speaking about me, Jay, and Church anyway. And um, partying kind of took over where Jay wasn't in school, but me and Church ended up dropping out of school. And just um, me and Church actually stuck together for uh, a good seven, eight years after high school because we're in the same situation. And then Jay kind of later came back around and was in the same scenario with us. But... Um, I remember, all right, I'm trying not to go too far into stuff. Oh, no, I mean, thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing that. That's that's a, an incredible story, and there's really no – you can go wherever you want to go. Um, all right, so, I have all right, some questions, right. but feel free to share whatever you want to. So, um, Gary was already in the picture. Um, um, so, after we, we did all kinds of apartment hopping um, – we had a nice house actually at one time and we started selling um, lower tabs and we're making a lot of money doing that. And um, Jay's mom kind of came in the picture with that where she knew a doctor's prescription number and she was calling in prescriptions for me, church, Jay, anybody that we could use. And um, it was a crazy time, man. And so me and church fast forward a few years after living that life, we ended up at a, I don't know if you ever heard, have you heard of Ray Motel over there on Bonin Division? It was right across the street from, um, I, uh, what are you talking about? Yeah, Bonin Division's a bad area. But um, it was a crackhead type hotel. And um, I would throw on a church with a cross on it. And I'd have some raggedy shorts. I'd go to a quick trip. And I didn't have a sign or anything. But uh, people would just drop money in my pocket. And that's how we were affording our drug habit. That's how we we're paying for a hotel. Um, that's how we we're paying for the little money we spent on food at that time. Cause our drug habit was pretty expensive at the time. And, um, church's brother kind of knew what was going on. So he told church, Hey, I'm going to come down and visit. Um, you can come back with me to Missouri to see what you think about it. If you want to come back, I'll bring you back. But, um, he was just trying to get church out of the situation and, um, get him back in the right mindset. So when church left, I was kind of by myself, or I was by myself, and um, being around those type of people, um, I never got robbed, except for like once or twice, which I don't know how that happened, but uh, as you know, I carry myself pretty well. People don't realize, you, you know that I'm disabled, but the way I carry myself, it's like you don't even see it, 
and unless you know me, that's kind of hard to explain. But um, so that lasted for about a month until my brother called me. Um, he moved to Minnesota. He graduated 2000 and, uh, 2007, 2007, 2007 or 2008. This is my younger brother. Younger, I have a Cody who was 06, and then Matt and Megan, I think, were 08. And um, they moved back to Minnesota to be with their biological dad. And that's, or I'm sorry, Matt did. And he started working with his dad and um, he met his, his neighbor was like 10 years older than him, a female. And he knocked her up and had a kid and they didn't work out. So my brother was lonely. He, he was codependent at the time. And um, he, he called me and had said, was like, hey, if I get you a ticket, would you be willing to come up here and you can live with me rent free? I'm just trying to look for a job and get your, you know, your shit together. I know what you've been telling me what's going on. You don't, you're, you're not a good place for you right now. And out of desperation, you know, at the time I thought I wanted to do it, but looking back out of desperation, I said, yeah, sure. And right after I hung out with, hung up with him, um, I started researching doctors in Minnesota because uh, I learned I could go to a doctor and say, hey, my, uh, my right hip, it's not a ball and socket. It's just, you remember my little leg, my little, mm -hmm. there's no ball and socket. It's just a bone, uh, my femur, which is, I think like six inches long, just attached by muscle and cartilage. Somehow it stays together and it never broke. It never really hurt. But when I tell a doctor it hurts, when they take an x-ray, they can't tell me, oh, no, it doesn't, because they don't know what it is. They've never seen it before. So um, this was probably back in the 2008, 2007, 2008 time, maybe 2009, 2007, 2008, where doctors weren't tracking, you know, what other doctors you've seen, because they, they started tracking since then and it became very difficult. So I was hitting up all kinds of doctors, getting all kinds of prescriptions to, um, to settle my habit as well as to pay my bills and to pay everything else. And um, so when I got off the phone with my brother, I immediately found a doctor in Minnesota and had everything lined up for when I went. So he bought me a ticket. Um, I remember before I left, I made sure I got enough of what I needed um, to last me for the, the the weekend I was going and then I had a doctor lined up for the Monday um, after I got there so the only thing I wasn't thinking through because being an addict I was just worried about getting my next fix I wasn't worried about what all comes with that but um, I didn't know anybody in the street at the time so when I ran out I ran out and I was going through huge prescription um, and you can edit this if you want to but I was taking anywhere from eight to 10 oxycodone thirties a day with two Xanax bars. And I snorted them. I crushed them up and snorted them. So I would blow through a prescription of like 90 to 120 board tabs in a week and mix that with benzos, which the, the Xanax, when you don't, when you, when you have that big of an intake and then just bam, you don't have that in your system anymore. Doctors prescribe small amounts for a reason, because if you run out, you're not going to be that sick. But if you're, if you're intaking that much at a time, your body's going to have major withdrawals. And um, so that's what happened. My brother got to see firsthand of when I was going hard to when I ran out and didn't have anybody on the street to go get anything from. Man, I thought the, the TV remote was a phone. I thought my drug dealer from Arlington was coming to get me because I owed him money. Um, I had my dad thinking I was back in Texas at the quick trip, needing him to come pick me up. It was crazy, man. And so my brother was like, this is not what I got you here for. So I can either drop you off at the hospital or um, you can go to the mission or something. Cause I can't, you know, this, I can't, I can't help you. And so uh, I wound up at the hospital and that led me to a 72 hour detox and then um, a 28 day treatment facility in Minnesota. That was in the winter of 2012. And I don't know if you've been in Minnesota in the middle of winter time, but snow is crazy, man. Like it's feet of snow. It's not just inches. Right. right. And walking with my legs, you know, it was a big struggle. So um, that's when I got on the phone with dad and he was like, you know, well, I'm not going to fly you back home but I'll fly you to Salina and you can, uh, cause he had some contacts there from when he was here getting clean. And, um, 
So the original plan was to go to an Oxford house. Have you heard of Oxford houses? Mm -hmm. They're, uh, they're trend, they're recovery homes. So in an Oxford house, you have a chore, you have to go to so many AA meetings a week and you have to have a job, but they're democratically ran. So everything that's ran in there in the houses comes to a vote and that's what happens. There's no, there's no bosses or no, you know, someone that makes an ultimate decision. It's all a vote. So when they heard the word handicap, they're like, oh shit, he can't do a chore. He can't get a job. So I didn't even get a vote to get an interview. So um, my dad had me talk to a counselor that he had that was still in the recovery scene here in Salina. And um, I found a serenity house. And those are, um, they're transitional housing. You know, people coming out of prison can go there until they transition. Um, drug addicts, alcoholics that are trying to get sober. Um, go to that house, they have a six month program where you have to go to meetings every day, you have a chore, you have to find a job, so on and so forth, and you get UA'd and, and breathalyzed every day. So I, you know, they just said, yeah, come on, we have, we don't have any open beds, but we got a couch. And so uh, I flew from Minnesota to Salina. I don't know anybody in Salina. I know I knew my, a few of my dad's friends. So, uh, here I am coming to Salina, Kansas to a halfway house with probably 15 other guys, not knowing anybody other than those people. But um, I'm a pretty outgoing person, make friends real easy. So, I mean, it wasn't a problem making friends within the house and getting in routine. Um, the only bad thing that happened was, um, so the way those houses run is they have the top of the line, Todd. He's the boss of all the houses. He makes all the decisions. But within each house, he has a few houses. And within each house, there's a house dad and a peer captain, um, the house dad kind of watches over the, the peer captains to make sure the house is running smooth, checks are getting, or the checks, the tours are getting checked, um, UAs are being given out, everybody's paying rent on time, nobody's just hanging around the house. So um, within a month of being there, I was doing so well, they made me a peer captain. And in hindsight now, what tells me I was there at a desperation is right when I became a PC, peer captain, my job was to give out UAs. And so my dumbass, I'm not going to UA myself at the time. So I found a doctor here in Salina and started doing the same old shit. Um, except I wasn't doing as much as I normally would. I wasn't snorting because, you know, that's too complicated to hide. So um, I wasn't going crazy, crazy with it, but I was taking them off throughout the house. I ended up graduating because I, I wasn't going to UA myself. And um, they've since changed that protocol where everyone gets you aid, even the PCs and house dads. But, um, so I became a PC. I met a girl. There's always a girl. <laughs> and, um, when I met her, she um, was having teeth issues. And so she was getting lower tabs as well. And, um, it wasn't toxic at first, but after we, I stayed together, you know, with her until I graduated the house. I don't know why we thought this. This makes no sense looking back. But the day after I graduated the house, me and her moved into a hotel thinking we'd save money to get our own place, da 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 da. And this is equivalent to what Bone and Division Hotel is because it was cheap. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what we were thinking. I mean, right when we moved in there, uh, meth is really prevalent here in Kansas. And um, we started doing that. I had my prescriptions coming in. Uh, she fell in love with meth. And she ended up running off with the, our neighbor, <laughs> who was the dealer. And uh, that's who she ran off with. So um, I was left to my own devices. So after we split, um, I chewed on fentanyl patches. We both chewed on fentanyl patches. I was getting fentanyl patches, by the way, <laughs> and oxycodone. And we chewed on the patches. But we'd always watch each other. You know, if we were chewing them, if one fell asleep, if we fell asleep, we'd wake each other up. Because if you fall asleep with one in your mouth, you die. <laughs> So um, I wasn't thinking, I didn't try and kill myself. I was just doing what I always did, but I wasn't thinking there's nobody watching me if I fell asleep. So I was at a friend's house. She went, this was what, December of 14. So um, it was me and her daughter were at the house. We were watching Home Alone. And I guess I uh, was chewing on a patch and fell asleep because when Sylvia got back, um, her daughter was just asleep. And I was asleep, but I wasn't breathing. <laughs> and I was blue. Wow. She had to dig a patch out of my mouth. She called the paramedics. They had to resuscitate me. Um, 
I was in Podunk, Kansas at that time, about an hour away from Salina, so they had to bring me back to the Salina Hospital. I was placed in a coma. I was on a ventilator. Um, I woke up, and the way I remember waking up was I'm pulling the ventilator out of my mouth, and I had no idea. I don't remember being at my friend's house. Um, definitely had no I had no remembrance of being in the hospital or anything. So um, that was another traumatic, crazy time. But luckily, I wasn't breathing for seven minutes. Um, I still remembered everybody, everything, my, my past, but I forgot how to do everything. I forgot how to pee. I forgot how to eat. I forgot how to get dressed. I forgot how to walk. I forgot how to work a cell phone. <laughs> like, I literally forgot. That's where the brain damage came in. You know, I still remembered everybody and everything, but I forgot how to do everything. So they got me into, after I was up and around for a while, they got me into a, a nursing home that had a rehab unit. Um, I still was not sleeping right due to the opiates um, withdrawal. So I wasn't sleeping right, which caused me to go kind of psychotic and think people were out to get me or um, thinking I was in other places. So I wound up naked in another resident's room. Don't know how the hell that happened. So uh, they had to give me the boot. <laughs> and so I wound back up at the hospital and um, I had a friend at the time who, who uh, let me stay with them at the time. But the crazy thing about addiction, man, is right when I got out of the hospital, almost or literally dying, that was the first damn thing that I started doing when I got out of the hospital. I got back in with my old friends and whatnot, started up with the meth and pills again. And um, I don't know if I was using this as an excuse to come back to Arlington because I knew more people. Um, drugs were more accessible to me. But, uh, you know, Lindsay Williams, she was working, uh, she still works for Spirit Airlines. So, um, she messaged me one day and says, like, hey, if I flew you back here, um, you can stay with me. You know, I just want to see you get back on track. I know you're not doing good in Kansas. So I had all kinds of people wanting to help out and help me and help me, and I took advantage of it. So um, Lindsay flew me back home, and I was using the justification of, oh, well, I just need to be around my family. Or I need the right support to guide me into getting back on the right track. That was all bullshit. That was, and I really believed it, though, at the time. Mm -hmm. but in hindsight it was just I wanted to be around people I knew because that's what happened I got back with Lindsay for a while within about a month I got back in the old friends um, with heroin and meth and um, Lindsay was like I can't do this anymore so I ended up moving with another friend who couldn't handle me so then I wound up at a wasn't a friend at the time but a friend that I met being around other people that uh, he was a heroin addict and meth addict as well he was the most functioning addict I've ever met had a big house I had my own room there I only had to pay like $100 a month. I'm on big ass TV, PlayStation, everything was just there. <laughs> so, um, meth was accessible. He sold it. We we're both addicts. We always were getting stuff. And this is where my miracle happened. If I don't know if you're familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous or not, but they say hang out until the miracle happens. And I think my miracle happened before I got an AA because I really feel God talked to me. When I was on the couch or on my bed, I actually woke up and was like, damn, man, you're 29 years old. You have no family. I mean, I have dad, but I have no kids, no wife. And that's something that has always been super important. To me. It's something I've always wanted. You have no solid career. You're bouncing around call centers or panhandling or collecting disability. You're not, you're existing. You're not living a life. You're almost 30, man. Like you're not getting any younger. Um, I didn't want to be one of those 40 year old dads that was 70, 80 years old watching my kids graduate high school or, you know, just being that old as a parent. Right. So that's when the mind shift change happened. Uh, it's it like the light bulb went on. And um, I got up a hold of a, con a buddy I, I had in Salina that was doing well. It was actually a house out of mine in the Serenity House. And uh, he bought me a plane ticket back to Salina. And that was what? October, right before Halloween of 2015. And um, I got back to the Serenity House November 4th of 2004. Um, 
and that was the last time I've never, I haven't used any drugs. I mean, I've drank from time to time now, but um, that's what I use as my clean day, November 4th, because I've not used any opiates, no illegal drugs. Um, I drink from time to time, but that was the day everything stopped. And it's crazy because once I stopped doing all that, opportunities started popping up. <laughs> it's crazy that it happened. But um, so they don't have many call centers here in Salina as far as, because um, that's what I was used to doing in Arlington call center and uh, they didn't have any here but they did have a walmart and they had to have a job in the serenity house so um, i was a walmart beater door beater one of those people saying hey smiling and checking receipts as they walked out yeah so it was a paycheck for me to pay rent take care of things um it was a very boring job after about six months because i'm capable of doing so much more than that um I don't regret it though, because I met just about all the Salina, because Salina is a population of about 40, 50,000 people. So Walmart, the happening spot, is the go-to spot for the whole city. So um, a lot of networking opportunities came from that. Um, my current boss at Independent Connection, she didn't meet me directly, but she did see me and ask questions about me and found me on social media and uh, she called me one day and she was using the, the direction of approaching me with a speaking gig opportunity. And at that time I was brand new to the speaking stuff. Um, that happened about for about six months after moving back to Salina. That's always been a dream of mine from a young age, either that or um, being an ESPN analyst. I'm sorry if I'm going back and forth, man. I'm just. No, it's uh, perfect, man. This is great. So. I met someone in Salina that knew an international motivational speaker and they got us in contact. He actually came up to Salina. He had an engagement in Salina and we actually got to shoot the shit for a little bit. And he was starting a class called Go Launch Me, which was for upcoming speakers that was that were just starting out. And um, he invited me to that class free of charge. And so that's when I started being able to focus on what I want my messages to be, um, what I want my goals to be. It wasn't exactly what I'm, my expect. I, I sometimes hold expectations. Sometimes I've learned it's not great to do because you'll be disappointed. So it didn't really mean all the expectations I was having. I thought he'd have me um, linked into like a speaking bureau or something like that, but it was just to prepare me for my messages, for my future engagements, which was a great thing. And, um, Even at that though, it gave me some organization, but as I started speaking more frequently, it's hard for me to, or it was hard for me to break things down into different messages instead of just doing a life story. And that hindered me because associations, um, schools, different groups, they want different messages corresponding with whatever topic that the event's about. So I eventually learned to break my whole life story down into different messages, which you can see on my website at davidpalaspeaking.com. So, okay, I'm all over the place again. So working at Walmart, I was working at Walmart and I did have a couple couple gigs come up. And at that time they were all free because I was just starting out. I didn't have the confidence to charge people because I was new at it. I didn't feel like I'd be giving them their money's worth. So there was a couple places that paid just because that's what they wanted to do. But um, backtracking again, I met my current director where I work at now at Independent Connection. Um, she came at me with uh, a speaking engagement conversation instead of just offering me a job. Well, that's how I perceived it anyway. I was really nervous about the call because I was new with the speaking stuff. I wanted to make sure I knew exactly how to answer questions the best possible way. So I was very nervous. And um, she threw hints throughout that conversation that she was hiring um, independent connection. We, uh, we advocate for other people, for people with disabilities, um, whether it's assisting file for disability, assisting with Medicaid applications, any kind of applications um, we assist with. Um, we assist with peer support. We assist with independent living skills. Um, anything someone wants to learn that makes their life independent, we can help them learn that skill. So perfect job for me but I wasn't picking up on the hints that she was throwing at me because I was so focused on answering her speaking questions and making sure I had that tied up. 
So after we hung up the call, I had a minute to breathe. And I was like, well, damn, dude, I, I really think she was offering me a job. So I called back because I was getting bored at Walmart at the time, like I said. Right. So I called back and she was, that's what she was doing. I was like, well, shit, I'm sorry. I didn't catch up on it. I was worried about, you know, the speaking stuff. So um, she said, well, it's protocol. I have to interview three different people because we're a nonprofit. We're funded by the state. So there's certain requirements she has to do for the state. So she's like, come in for an interview. Um, I'm going to interview other people, but I'm going to hire you. So just come in for the interview. So I started working there, what, 2000. 18 yeah 2018 because i'm coming up on my two years here in a few days so um i've been doing that side by side with my speaking stuff and i started off part-time i just recently went full-time about six seven months ago so when i was part-time i still had all this extra time where if i did have speaking engagements come up you know, i was working part-time so i could just schedule them in a way where it wouldn't affect work so i became full-time but coming with full time, you have vacation, you have sick days, you have time you can use for speaking gigs with all it all is working out. Um, the only downside to the speaking part, so I have, I'm backtracking again. So when I was working at Walmart, <laughs> I met my current fiance. She was working at the deli at the time. And um, we kicked it off immediately, uh, started dating. She had three kids prior. Um, she had a, at that time, she had a five-year-old, and the boys are 10 months apart, so they were, what, a little over one and then three months. So they never knew. The boys never knew their bio dad, so I've always been dad because I've known them since, you know, one years old and two months. So I'm the only dad that they've ever known. Their dad kind of dipped out. So, which I'm very grateful for because they think of me as their dad. They call me dad, mm -hmm. and um, I feel as they are my, my kids. Um, Brooke, she knows her dad and still talks to him from time to time that he's in and out of jail. You know, he's not the best role model. So being a step kid, from my experience, I know not to push. Well, I'm your dad. You're going to follow me. If I'm paying the bills, you're going to follow what I say. No, I don't do that. Right. So I let her do what she wants to do. You know, that's her dad. Awesome. No, I'm not going to discourage that. My mom wasn't the best mom <laughs> growing up, but I loved her to death and wanted to be a part of her life. So I would never discourage that with her. Uh, but she does have that bond with the dad, but I have a different bond with the boys because I'm their dad. Um, 2018, we had our own son, which is my first biological. Greatest feeling in the world. You being a dad, you can probably relate 100%. When they're born, it just changes you at that moment. You created something that is a part of you that you made, and you want to do anything in your power to protect that and make sure they are taken care of to the best of your ability and then some. Um, I don't even appear. I've talked about a million different things just now. Oh, man, so. it's a hell of a story. I'm, I'm super grateful for you sharing all that. And <laughs> despite the fact that you sort of cover all that very methodically and very calmly, there's a lot of depth to so much of what has happened to you. Um, obviously, the addiction is a big thing, and I've, I've never. I guess in a clinically sense, personally been addicted, but there have definitely been been times where I've been observed some behavior like that or have an, a, an unhealthy relationship with something. I'm just curious if in that 10 year period, were there, you know, obviously accepting the times where, where you were getting treatment. I mean, did you have a sense that, that something was wrong or were you just completely blinded to the fact that, that, that the path you were on was not good for you? So I actually did know something was wrong but being an addict, you don't give a shit. <laughs> right. So I knew my family history. Um, my mom was a, a pill junkie as well. And she, she would used to, she used to bring me to her doctor's appointments to get sympathy. And as I told you, I ended up subconsciously doing the same thing she did. I, I'm a firm believer on that. You're a product of your environment. Right. And I followed her footsteps with manipulating doctors and getting what I wanted. So um, I knew there was a problem, but being an addict, and while you're in addiction, you just don't give a shit. You're just worried about getting more and getting money to get more. So, so uh, looking back on that now, do you remember, 
I know this may be kind of a hard question to answer, but was, was there like a, a pivotal moment that you you kind of think of as the beginning of that road? Because like you said, in, in high school, there might have been a little bit of drug use, some alcohol, but it wasn't, but you still got through high school and everything was okay. So do you remember like at what point or kind of what the steps were towards it becoming kind of a, a just an all-consuming part of your life? Yeah. Um, it started with me, Gary, and Jane Church at our first apartment. And um, we had a couple – People we went to school with, um, the graduated ahead of us, um, Ed, or Lindsay's ex-boyfriend, uh, um, him and Mandel, remember Mandel, Sanders. Man, that name sounds so weird, but I, I can't He was at all the parties we went to. Um, but Mandel and Ed had a connection with Lower Tabs. So we tried, I mean, with all of us, we had our experiences with Coke, you know, marijuana, your typical college experience drugs. But um, the first time Ed gave me a lower tab, that's when I was like, holy shit. <laughs> this is all that got me out of all the drugs I've tried. I've never really been addicted to any other yeah, drugs. Okay. Like opiates. And um, Jay's mom, um, she got pain pills, which she wanted to trade for cigarettes and stuff all the time. So, I mean, it was easy access. And me, Church and, me, Church and Jay just started it, never really stopped. Um, as I said, Gary never, he never got, you know, really into anything. He experimented with stuff with us, but he never got hooked on anything. So he moved on, but me and Jay Church were just stuck in that life. Um, That's wild, man. And I remember you, I, I remember at the time, you know, hearing one way or another, I remember the period of time where you were working at the call center. That stands out in my memory. Um, but I never, I, I never was well, that's aware another, that's all another story how bad it was. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Um, after high school, that's a big part of the story too, the call. <laughs> um, I started working at Silverleaf. Um, it's a call center in Pantigo, or it was a call center. They've closed down since then. But have you seen the movie Boiler Room with Ben yeah. Diesel? Dude, we weren't making as much money as they were, but it was a spitting image. We got spiffed. If we met a quota, we'd get lines of coke. We'd get pills. We'd get a beer. You know, it was crazy, dude. Wow. And... Yeah, the silver leaf's a big part of my story. I'm so glad you brought that up. So working at silver leaf, I still, you know, everybody was doing stuff there too. And um, when we started getting prescriptions, that's where our money was coming from. You know, I'd be selling pills at a silver leaf because every on payday, dude, it was crazy. They'd, I'd have hundreds of pills and they'd all be gone that same day wow. because that's what everybody did there. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll, I want to re-answer your question. Where did it all start? I think it actually started at Silverleaf because I started working at Silverleaf at the department with Gary and whatnot. But I think when I started working there and just opening my eyes to everything that was everybody else was doing and whatnot, along with Ed and Mandel and Jay's mom and everybody, just a combination of all that. Mm -hmm. I guess I really can't tell you a pinpoint time of when it all started, but yeah, Silverleaf was crucial. That was a crazy year and a half working there yeah i mean just like you said right, you're a product of your environment and, and that was your environment so it, it definitely had an effect i'm sure um so you, you kind of answered the question about you know the the first time where you really sat down and started thinking about like how do i want to show up um i'm curious how you think about all that stuff that you've been through because in my opinion um you know, so many people try to live a life that doesn't have adversity or challenge. And I think that the people who go through the biggest challenges have the biggest voice to give the biggest message, the biggest impact that they can have because of the things they've been through. I'm just curious now about your, you know, kind of your perspective and how you package it in your mind, thinking about everything you've been through and, and how that positions you to be better at what you're doing now. That's a great question. Um, the way I compare myself to, to help other people kind of maybe relate or understand what I'm saying better is I feel that, and I'm Christian, by the way, I believe in God, full force, full faith in God. Um, I believe that he gives people gifts. Um, he gives athletes great speed, great agility, great hands for receivers or, you know, great power for linemen. Um, he gives doctors great brains, uh, great dexterity with their hands for surgeons. Um, I truly feel that God put me here 
and he put me through all my experience that I've been through because he knew I could handle it the way I did and use all those experiences to help other people. I really feel this is my purpose in life. Um, you know, my message has ranged from addiction. It ranges from losing a parent at a young age. It, it ranges from following your dreams and turning your dreams into realities. Um, I have an employment presentation. When I first started working at Silverleaf, it was me, Jay, and Church that went in to apply. Um, we all left, think we did great, put in our application. The next day, Jay and Church got their calls for orientation. I was waiting on mine. I was like, oh, maybe they're, they're getting to me, you know, whatnot. And um, the day went by, I didn't hear shit. I was like, man, they think I can't do something. So what I did is I just went to the orientation with them. And I said, hey, I need to talk to your director. And luckily, they agreed and he was available. So all I had to show him is that I could write and type on a computer and answer a phone. And I was in the same orientation class as they were. Mm -hmm. So I have an appointment presentation that shows people how to advocate for yourself, how to not take no for an answer, because if you do, you won't get opportunities. Um, some people don't know how to speak up for themselves, so I'm hoping by showing them what I did, maybe they can learn from my experience on how to speak up for yourself or kind of gauge, you know, if if you apply somewhere and you don't get a call back, don't just let it ride without saying something, call them back and be like, hey, do I need to show you I can do something? Or just show up at the door at their business and be like, hey, I applied here. Is there something I need to show you? <laughs> because when, you, when someone sees the person with no arms, you know, walking across the headaches, they assume which they still do today, and we advocate at work, because this happens with, at work all the time with people getting discriminated against. Um, my motto with speaking is changing perspectives, and as for the perspective of people with disabilities, to don't let it stop you, you're capable of what the sky's the limit. And then I also want to change this, the perspective of mainstream society on the stigma that comes with the word disability. Um, on how a lot of us are capable of doing anything anybody else can, but first impressions, first physical impression is people make assumptions. They don't ask, they don't ask questions. That's what really drives me crazy. If you just ask a question, I could answer it and we can move forward instead of you assuming you know the answer and then it winds up negatively. I mean, yeah, I don't, no that seems so uh, relevant to me. And I think that probably applies to people without disabilities too, right? Like, yeah. You know, you go to apply for a job and you, I know you look at your, your black, white, Asian, whatever, you're dressed a certain way, you walk a certain way, you talk a certain way. And it automatically people have those assumptions about your ability to do a particular task. So yep. yeah, I think that message is, is so, so powerful. Um, I'm curious what, what kind of advice or guidance would you give or, or, what, or, or maybe have already given to somebody in this situation to somebody who's dealing with the loss of a loved one. I mean, it seems very relevant right now with COVID-19 going around. There's going to be people, people that lose loved ones. I'm just curious from your experience, how you would counsel somebody in that situation. Make sure you have a good support system. Um, life's going to be hell for the first couple of years. It's not something that ever goes away. I'm what, 19, 20 years since my mom died. Um, I pray every night and I still talk to my mom every night and that's from 20 years ago. So I mean, I still think about her just about every day. Right. It's totally like I can talk about it now without getting emotional or whatnot. But the first probably five years after losing her, I could not, if it got brought up, I'd get emotional. So have a support system. Um, I didn't have a counselor. I don't know if that would benefit or not. That's the type of thing where you can't, tell them the right answer. You can give them advice on having a support system and whatnot, but you have to go through something to see how you personally react to it. Because everybody's different, everyone's gonna react differently. But with my experience, I had a great support system. You know, my dad had a couple friends. Um, this was before I really got in with you, Adam, and all of them. But I um, had a couple other friends that really helped me through that. Um, that first year was just, yeah, it's crazy. I don't know if that answered that question at all, but. No, you did. And you brought up another question. I'm curious, you know, you, you kind of went through a few years after she had passed and then you kind of got into addiction and the alcohol and the drugs and all that. Um, 
how did you and when did you eventually actually kind of process through what had happened and get to the point where you could talk about it, you know, calmly without having that emotion? You, you, you said you didn't do so, any kind of therapy. And so I'm just curious how you, you know, managed that. that okay. Time. So remember when I said I was drinking a lot in high school, mm -hmm. uh, after high school, that's when I got into the drug scene. So I was masking those feelings. So I never dealt with them. You know, right. I was just hiding them. So when I got sober, um, you do, you get a sponsor is what they call them within AA. They help you walk through the, it's a 12 step program. So they go through the steps with you. And um, the fourth step is making a fearless and moral inventory of yourself. So it's pretty much like a life story, like a really detailed, it takes a few months to go through that step. And you go detail throughout your life and all your experience, the sexual experiences, drug experiences, any kind of experiences your whole life throughout that step. And that allows you to be clear headed. You're not masking any feelings about it. It allows you to be able to deal with it. Um, enough time went by where I really, I mean, I get, I got emotional sometimes when we talked about mom, but um, I think AA really helped me deal with those feelings. Uh, my sponsor helped me deal with those feelings. Um, yeah, I think when I got sober is when that allowed me to actually process. I mean, I knew what had happened, but it allowed me to process my feelings that I had from that, that I've been hiding you know, for the last eight, nine years. Yeah, so, no, uh, and having never been there, I can only imagine that it would definitely take some time to, to work on that. Um, man, and there's just, there's so much to your story. It's really incredible. Again, to, to hear you talk about everything so calmly because there's, I mean, so much, um, I don't know if tragedy is the right word, but things that, I mean, very difficult circumstances, you know, and adversity that you've overcome. Um, right. I, I'm curious, you know, do you think about what's in store for you in the next five or 10 years? I mean, do you plan that far out or are you, you know, just focus on so today? That, I'm, I'm, that, that brought me back to another question I halfway answered earlier. I got sidetracked. But um, the one thing I struggle, and this will segue into what I'm going to say, um, the only downfall of my speaking stuff is I haven't been, I haven't figured out necessarily if I had the time between kids and work, I could probably make the time to learn by my, to learn. And I eventually will, if I can't find assistant, an assistant to do it. But all my speaking engagements have come from word of mouth mm -hmm. and social media. Um, I have never really reached out to any associations. I haven't reached out to, um, mm -hmm. I have a couple schools, but I haven't reached out to, there's so many different clients that prospective clients that are out there. I just haven't had the time to actually sell my, I don't know if sell is the right word. I haven't been, I haven't been able to do outreach for myself to get more business. It's just been all word of mouth. Right. So this last month I've been trying to find an assistant that, um, you know, I pay commission for, but, um, someone who's experienced with that kind of job, you know, like an agent or like a manager or something to that extent. Because what my goal is, you know, I have huge goals. Um, I want this to be international at some point where, you know, if I eventually have to leave my current day job, that's cool. I love doing what I do. Don't get me wrong. Um, but my full heart and passion is my speaking. That's like my baby. That's been a dream of mine for my whole life and now that I'm kind of getting my feet wet in it that's what I want to do um, my ideal goal is to be able to travel two weeks out of the month be home two weeks out of the month be with family and whatnot um, be my own boss of course so I don't gotta be told what to do I can be right. my own boss I think everybody kind of feels that way that's why entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs um, I want to do a little consulting um, I have huge plans with this, but due to everything that I have going on in my life right now with four kids, um, I'm halfway planning a wedding for next year. Um, the COVID situation is not helping anything. Right. right. Um, it's kind of putting the world at a pause. So um, it's a work in progress, though. You know, I've, I've been doing it for for probably, what, three and a half, four years now, the speaking part of things. Um I don't know if you've heard of Gary Vanderchuk. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, I follow him all the time. Um, he's kind of inspired me to realize to calm down. I'm impatient. And I, when I, when I want to do something, 
I don't think of everything that it takes to do that. I just want to think of the end point, get any corners I can and get to that end point. Right. But you have to put time into building your business. And I feel like that's what I'm doing now, where in five years from now, I can look back and be like, you were so nervous about making sure everything happened. And now look at you. You were preparing for everything. You're putting in the work. And now you're doing what you wanted to do. So that's, that's my five-year plan, I guess, with that. Yeah. That and there's an interesting <laughs> correlation there because you talked about kind of your, your 10 year experience with addiction and how that was, you know, growing you and molding you to be able to do this thing now. And um, I, I think a, a similar perspective is helpful sometimes to realize you, you're, you're, you may still be in a different kind of developmental phase, obviously not with the addiction, but like you said, it may take, what if it took 10 years or, or five years to get there? But at the end of that, you were doing the international tours and, and speaking on stage just two weeks out of the month. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. I resonate with that a lot. Just being patient and not trying to rush things. The right things will happen in the right time for sure. Yep. sure um, you mentioned a couple of things I'm curious about. So one was the kids and I'm curious how, how your story and everything you've been through has affected the, the way you parent? Um, Another good question. So that's always been also a thing that I've thought about growing up. You know, when I have kids, how am I going to change a diaper? How am I going to make a bottle? Um, how am I going to throw my kids up in the air and catch them and twirl them around? Just do like the normal, typical father roles. Right. And um, after having kids now, I've accepted, and it's not a big deal now that I'm in the situation. Oh, who cares if I can't pick up a kid and catch him? You know, that's not a big deal. But meeting Logan and Aiden at a young age and Emmett, you know, being his dad, known him all his life. It's weird. The kids adapt to the way I handle them. So the way I pick them up, you know, when, when um, Logan was little and when Emmett was little and even Aiden to an extent, you know, if they roll to their side, I can pick them up with my cheek and my shoulder and throw them over my shoulder. And that's how I carry them. And as they grow up, all I have to do, you know, when I walk on my knees, well, I don't, can't really see, but all I do is bend over. They put their arm around my neck. And I just pick them up. <laughs> and that, that, I don't even have to say anything. They just know that's how I pick them up. You know, if my kids want to be helped by their parents. They come up to me and all I got to do is put my head down and they get on. That's how I call it. And, um, you know, situate them however I have to. And I have learned how to change diapers with my feet. I'm a pro with the game now. <laughs> um, now that I have a videographer, I just got a videographer not too long ago and we're going to do some more. Um, I had a YouTube channel at one time, but it was kind of on and off throughout my addiction. So it was never handled the best way, I don't think. But um, I want to get a video of helping parents. That that's another message that I'll have. You know, parenting with a disability to show them. A lot of people may have a broken leg. A lot of people may have a a missing hand or something. Something kind of catastrophic. But then again, compared to myself, it's not that big a deal. And that's I'm trying to stay focused and not go down other rabbit holes. Um, so. I can see myself, you know, having a presentation where helping anybody really on how to parent if they have a disability, they can. Throughout a lot of my messages, I feel when they see a guy up on stage, I don't want my legs. I have a table up on stage where I hop up on the table and then I hop down in the crowd, throw football <laughs> with them, go figure. I have to do some in, um, engaging activities or interacting activities. But, um, I keep on losing my train of thought. We were talking about your kids at first, and, uh, and it's kind of how you got to talk about the channel. Um, I, I wanted to follow up with how have you thought about how you'll use your story of addiction and drugs and, and how that will influence the lessons you teach them or how you handle those topics with them when they get older? I hope to God it doesn't happen that way, but if it does, I'm prepared. Right. I mean, I learned a lot of that. My dad having it, that, I'm so grateful to have the father that I have because if you line up our lives at the same age, it's crazy how parallel they are. Mm -hmm. um, when my dad split with my mom, he met his current wife that had three kids before coming into it, and then he had me. So he had a family. We had a family of six growing up. 
Um, he has a drug addiction past. Um, so him raising me or him seeing me go through my addiction, he tried, you know, there was a time too where, like I told you, he was a recovering addict and he had a hip replacement that went bad. So he had to start wow. taking lower tabs and he got you know, back in his old ways for a minute. But um, there was times where we'd be making runs to go get lower tabs together. And um, I don't know if that's really gives you an idea of how parent. And then, okay, so, and he gives me hope a lot too because he has a government job that he's had for 10 plus years making six figures. I'm not a hungry, hungry person, but especially having kids, I want to have enough. I want to be fine. I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be, you know, Tom Brady rich, but I want to have a nice house where each kid has their own room. We have a family of six. I grew up sharing a room with my brothers. We had a four bedroom house, but my dad, my parents had their room. Megan had her own room because she was a female. And then me and Matt had our, me, Matt and Cody had our room. And then my dad had his office to work out of. So I want to, and this kind of ties into the legacy thing too. I want to make sure my kids, I want to, I want to make our family a legacy, um, a force to be reckoned with. Um, I'm not trying to sound arrogant or conceited when I say this, but I want us to have nice things because I want us to be comfortable. Let me, I don't think I want to think many dead part. I want everyone to have their own room. I want everyone to have what they want. Um, Kind of thing before I talk here. I want to make sure my kids, my family has everything accessible to them that they need to have everything they need to be taken care of and then some. Um, I don't want to be, because at one time I was a family struggling where we drove a crappy car and lived in a crappy place. I just don't, I've been through that experience. So I'm not trying to sound arrogant when I say I want to have nice things. It's just that I've been on the, the downside to that. And I don't want my kids having to go through that experience. Does that yeah. kind of make sense a little bit? Or? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, it just, it's kind of related to something else I wanted to ask you. I'm just, you know, from everything that you've been through, the lessons you've learned, all the, you know, I'm sure you, you kind of, you, you show up with a new way of operating after you go through adversity. That's kind of the point, right? It changes you and you, you start to live in a different way. Um, are there any particular lessons or principles that um, you're really, you know, set on teaching your kids based on the stuff that you've learned? I mean, is there anything that's really important to you that, that they learn in, a, in an easier way than you did? I guess one thing I'm a, big believer on now and that I'll have my life together is being a man of your word. If you commit to something, stand to it. Um, that's why even on this call, I was planning on 10, but Popeye's, we went to Popeye's, drove through for dinner and they took 30 minutes to get us our food. So we're already behind. And then I started messing with the computer and the, the invite wasn't working right. So that's when I said, can we just do it at 930? Because I it's supposed to be at nine and I'm not sure what you were doing, if you were ready or not, but I want to, I don't even know if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm a bit, I follow through on my word now on everything. And I, that's, that's a lesson I want to teach my kids is if you say something, follow through, commit to it because first impressions are everything with people. And um, you know, I just want you to be a productive, efficient member of society. Um, I'm not a big believer. I'm not, hang on. I'm not to this point in life yet, but I'm not going to be a big pusher on college today's day and age you can be an entrepreneur you can i mean you can't go be a doctor without college of course there's certain things you have to have college for but there's so many different opportunities about having a college degree because it's it's really about who you know not what you know in today's society um but yeah i want to start a you know like or i say legacy because you got that in my head but i want to start like an empire for my family like a powell legacy a successful legacy. You know, I want us all to be protective in society. Um, I'm not saying this, I want us all to be rich, but I want us to all eventually have nice jobs and, you know, all be productive. And I don't know if that makes, I hope that oh, makes perfect sense. sense. Um, yeah. And there's, we've covered a lot of ground and there's, um, you know, several of the questions I had planned to ask you, but I do want to be respectful of your time and, and make sure that this thing doesn't take all night. So, um, 
you know, before we sign off, I want to make sure you, you tell the audience where to find you, how to track you down on the interwebs, you know, what you want them to do. If you want them to connect with you, I just want to give you an opportunity to share that with them. Okay. Um, website, as I mentioned earlier, is David or www.davidpowellspeaking.com. I said that kind of fast, davidpowellspeaking.com. Um, on the website, you will find pictures of past um, gigs that I had. You will find testimonials from some of those gigs. You will find my, they're called speaker menu items, which is a speaker menu, which has all my presentations that I offer. Um, now, just because the presentations you see on there, that I'm not, you're not limited to that. Um, I've had a kind of how my menu items formed. That I've had people calling saying, hey, we're trying to find a speaker on this. Can you, do you have anything on that? And then I'll make a, make a presentation based on that experience and it just becomes one of my presentations out on the list. Right. So um, but that's how you can find, and all my social media links are on the bottom um, just to make it easier for everybody. I'm um, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram with the handle um, at all thumbs 2004. That's A L L T H U M B S 2004. Um, I do have a YouTube channel that I, it's in the works. There's a, there's some videos on there right now. There's a bunch of videos on my Facebook page though. So if you want to check some stuff out, nothing really speaking related, but just a lot of how to in the life of David type stuff. Uh, my Instagram. I'm not as active on that as Facebook. Facebook, I'm most in, most active on, but um, YouTube channel is David Powell speaking. If you want to check it out, um, LinkedIn, David Powell. But LinkedIn's kind of hard to find because there's probably be a million David Powells. So um, yeah, and I can put yeah. everything in the show notes. So I mean, whatever you want me to have access to or want them to have access to, just send it to me, and I'll put the links directly in there so people can. They don't have to find you. They can just click on it and go straight to it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think that YouTube channel will be something you should pick back up, man. I think that'd be really oh, yeah. good. For you. I think that that's another business opportunity venue, too. Yeah, for you to get your content out there and for more people to discover you. Yep. Same here, man. That's um, awesome, man. So yeah, one more I question. Cover, I know we, I know we didn't get a, I feel like we left some stuff out. So I'm definitely open to doing another one. I don't know if the other one would last this long, but um, I did want to get into the legacy I know that's what your podcast is all about. Sure. I said my family wise, but then that's not incorporating the entire, the totality of what the big picture is. Um, so, I mean, that's a good time though. I mean, this is a good time to, if you, yeah. I mean, what, what does, what does legacy mean to you? We've touched on it a little bit, but I'm, I'm curious to, you know, get your synopsis family, of the big picture. Families, families number one. Um, but at the same time, I have to do my part within that family legacy and I think my part is doing my speaking stuff and being an example to my kids to, and even my fiance that don't let anything stop you. You know, if you want to do something, go do it, figure it out. Um, I know I'm not perfect in that and saying that, I mean, I do have my struggles such as not having the time to find out, you know, how to network the way I should be with my speaking stuff. But, um, 10 years from now, or maybe 20 years from now, I want the Powell name to be a known name. I don't know if it internationally, if it'll get to that point, but I want the Powell name to be a known name. And I think that starts with me um, through my speaking with traveling all over the place and making such a big impact on people where people are going to remember what I said and nobody's going to forget a guy popping up on stage without hands and legs. That's a good attention grabber. That's another, most people worry about, you know, grabbing the audience's attention. But I think right when I pop up on the table, holy shit, what is about to happen here? What is he going to say? So um, I just want the pound name to be a known name. And I want my kids following my footsteps with being successful in life. Um, I know addiction pops out of nowhere sometimes and other things that addition, in addition to addiction, um, being a mom at a young age, um, there's all kinds of other factors that could you know, happen throughout their teenage years and early adulthood, but I just want to be the best example I can be for them to show them how to live life and how to be a productive, respectful, um, responsible member in the world. That's excellent. 
Well, dude, I'm so grateful for your time, man. I'm really glad we could reconnect. Like I said, it's been about a decade, so it's well overdue. Uh, but I'm, I, I appreciate your time, man. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to get this out there and then maybe bring you back around for a second one later on and we can, we can cover yeah. the rest of the stuff we missed. I'm definitely open to that, man. Awesome, man. Great talking Thanks, to you. Man, brother. This is cool, man. Like you said, just talking to you personally, it feels like, I don't know, just talking to you it didn't, it didn't feel weird or anything. It feels like just where we left off, where we left off. Last time we saw each other, like it's not awkward or nothing. I love it. Yeah, man, it's great.